I always get the shakes before I drop. It wouldn't be so bad if I wasn't looking at my human companions and saw that they were all just so calm and almost mechanical in the way they operated things, getting all their gear ready for the drop. It was insane how just thoughtless they were, how completely blank they were, although it does stand to reason. They've been doing this type of warfare since they've had the technology to do this type of warfare, which is for several dozen of their decades. And some of them have been doing this for several decades. It's gotten to the point where, as my sergeant puts it, it's boring. I don't think about it too much. At least I try not to. As I strap myself into all my armor, I look around to each of my human compatriots. I am only one of three Zalaxians in this entire platoon. The rest are human, and they usually have to help us with our gear. We are basically the same shape and all, just as one guy puts it, you're a bit petite, which is a nice way, I guess, of saying thinner. Humans are much, much broader, and because of that, we have to put extra sort of padding on, as the drop seems to be a little more violent than we expected. At least the first time. As soon as we went into the war with the Kanchara, we realized we would have to find allies. And when we found the humans, we realized that we had found the perfect ally to help us out. It wasn't hard to convince them, of course, since the Kanchara would easily run over human space and take them all as either slaves or food. Very few times have the Kanchara ever thought of any other species of something else besides those two options. So of course humanity was more than willing to jump in, and as soon as we saw that one of their ships on its way to a colony was taking over the, like, the Kanchada and immediately was, well, eaten. Many of them screaming for anything, screaming into the comm system, screaming to their deity, screaming just to scream sometimes, and others screaming in pain as they were eaten from the feet up. This is a common practice, as the Kanchada know that once you eat the legs, it is very difficult for your prey to run away. Usually the prey will stay alive for much longer if you start this way as well, as many species, many of them, if you sever a limb, will stay alive for a lot longer than you would expect. Of course, this helps the food from not spoiling. This was enough to send all the humans into a frenzy. Many of them wanted as they would say, we want blood. At first, we thought that they simply wanted to eat the Kanchada, as the Kanchada had started to eat them. But no, we found out that that was simply a euphemistic phrase, that they wanted revenge on the Kanchada. They wanted to kill as many as possible, and they had their chance. The first incursion in the Kanchada face was completely a debacle. Though the humans did come out victorious, the amount of casualties they had even made my own small horns shiver with the thought. It was insane to think that they may actually have made it through. It was just crazy, the percentages. For those wondering, it was over 90%, and they still took the planet. Many of the humans that came back needed to have limbs regrown cybernetics put into place. Others were not salvageable and were simply medically retired, whatever the hell that means. I would see them every once in a while in some sort of support role, but it was very, very often the case where they would simply regrow the limbs, go through what they call physical therapy, and simply return back to us within a year. And then they would do it all over again. I look over as I see Johnson there as he has had his left arm blown off four times. It's getting to the point where he jokes about it enough. Maybe next time he'll get cybernetics as it won't hurt as much when it gets severed. But then again, humans have this weird thing about needing to have their own flesh and blood, at least as close to it as possible. I still don't understand it, but it is what it is. The only time I would ever think that it was a commonplace deal was when mating season happened, which was coming up soon, which I'm hoping this invasion was done for before then, because I really 
really don't want to miss this mating season. I've already missed the last two, and it would be an absolute shame to miss a third. As we head towards our pods, the corporal next to me walks up behind me and starts grabbing a hold of my gear, giving it a shake. This is not in any way, shape, or form to be a jokester or anything like that. He is simply making sure that it is completely tied down. As many of us, again, are so thin, our armor does not fit right. This would be a standard drop, yet everything had to be checked and double-checked and then checked again and again to make sure it was right. This was because on the drop you did not want to lose anyone. The drop itself would be, well, standard, but for those on the ground would be absolute hell. Standard drops have a very specific way of handling themselves. Once the battleships, destroyers, frigates, and all the other ships have taken over space and made it to at least lunar orbit, that's when we come in. The carriers holding all of our infantry are inside each of these ships, along with our associated weapons and armor and such. And, and it was from here that we would prepare. We headed towards our pods, the pods usually set with two to four personnel each, if it was a personnel only drop. If not, they would be dropping with extra weapons, extra ammo, and in some cases vehicles. But this depended, of course, on density of atmosphere, population, what targets were taken out, and of course, do you even need them? In some cases, there was so little to be offensive about that a few of them were actually pissed off. My entire platoon was actually mad at one jump where, as I was told, we didn't get to any fun. Wah. These humans are strange. These humans are very strange. As I head to my pod, I set in, and another human walks up and makes sure that I'm latched in correctly. Since we are so thin, we have to double-check our restraints. The humans fit perfectly in their pods and immediately can strap themselves in very quickly. Yet, another loadmaster comes through and checks them. And then someone called a jump master actually comes through and checks that as well. It is insane, the checks that have to be done. As we move into position, the drop commences, but we have to wait. A standard drop comes in waves, actually. When it comes down to a target, the first thing that is launched is a bunch of decoys. Decoys are launched in a huge mass and head towards the surface almost as fast as one of our pods. There is no type of shoot that happens. It simply goes into the atmosphere and then, being so small, the decoy slows down, just like one of our pods that opens a chute. It then emits a type of electronic signal that allows all the air defense systems to actually fire on them. This was what we waited for. Our anti-air was what we worried about. The anti-air would take out a pod and take out the trooper inside before they even had a chance to reach the surface, and that itself was unacceptable. And what we would need is the rest of the Navy to do their job. I found out quick as I joined the jump service that it would be more of a combined effort than I ever thought possible. Looking at some of the old recordings from human history, back in the their times before they even reached orbital flight. They would simply go on terrestrial aircraft and be thrown out the side of it, going out one at a time with primitive nylon to hold themselves up, and then they would be left to their own devices for entire planetary rotations. And they wouldn't complain the least little bit. Of course, they jumped with just as much gear as we carry, yet they did not have full body armor. It was insane to think about that, them jumping out with twice as much weight as we were actually weighing right now. And yet, all they complained about was, and I quote, it is a female dog to walk into this plane. What? I asked one of my human compatriots once, and he translated it. It still did not actually come to the translator right, so I left it alone. All in all, we can hear the thumps of the decoys being fired out, and we have to wait. We wait even longer. 
Another set of thumps goes out. But this one is not us either. We have to wait again. This one, once we find out where the anti-air is hiding, a whole bunch of ordnance is being fired out, whether direct weapons or through rocket-propelled ordnance to be fired down. These are fired two, sometimes three, towards a target to make sure they actually land on their target. With that, another round of decoys is fired right behind them, but these decoys are to help us. Within moments, another round of ordnance is fired at them. This time, it's again another bunch of rocket-propelled ordnance being fired down. We wonder if this is going to be it. And down we go, firing thump, 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 thump. You don't even know what number you're at. It's a random firing. That way, most people don't actually excrete fluids into their suit as they're about ready to go. We were told this is a common practice. The only one who knows they're the first one is the commander of each jump. They're always the first one. This seems to be more of an honor thing than anything else, as being the first one down would most likely mean that you are in the most dangerous position. As the decoys, the second round, started to make its way through the atmosphere, they would slow down, the rocket-propelled ordnance would whip past them, and then the decoys would begin not to fire any type of electronics to pull up any type of ordnance, but no, they would launch all sorts of smoke and flak and all sorts of things into the air. This was to block anyone from being able to fire back at us. Watching several of the videos afterwards, I was grateful for this, as many a time the adversaries would fire up at us and their rounds would simply explode inside all that good old-fashioned flak. We always jumped at night to limit their visibility, but there was also cloud cover, artificial cloud cover by these same decoys that would spray out in all directions and wouldn't even stop even after we passed by, just in case there was another round of pod troopers coming down. You always knew when your pod went through it. You would hear the metal clanging across the side, right under your feet, as you're going down, hoping at that point that your chute remembers to open. The metal chute would open up as soon as possible and start slowing you down. You would hear it breaking into pieces. Not the chute, but the exterior of our pods, as the heated portion would be glowing as it was coming through the upper atmosphere. It had to be expelled or else you're a giant target. At this point, as it pops free, if you listen close, you can hear the second round of ordnance hitting the ground. This many a times is anti-personnel ordnance, as it fires something they call a flechette round as it hits. This is why many a time when you land, there's no one left to oppose you. If there are, they're on the ground simply crying out for their mothers. As we get closer, the metal chute pops free and the actual silk, as they call it, pops loose. Three separate chutes. In all honesty, you only need one to survive the drop, but you always have three, just in case. If one doesn't work, or if one gets blown off, you always have a third one. This was always the most uncomfortable because as those chutes open, there's a huge jerk and if it wasn't for the fact that we were double and triple checked to make sure we were locked into place, I'm sure my vertebrae would start cracking under the pressure and shoot itself right through my craniums. That is not something I need. I worried a little bit because I knew this was the final 10 to 15 seconds we had before we hit the ground. My tail nervously twitched inside my suit as I worried I was about to hit. This always happened. Just like the shakes, it's not that you're nervous. Is that you're just ready to go. Three, two, one, and the pod crashes on the ground. As it does, you don't get a buzzer, you don't get a signal. The door just flies forward on exploding caps, and anything in front of you is knocked down. Immediately, I pull up my weapon and start moving around, checking all sides, looking for any type of cover, looking to see any of my mates. I began to go through all my systems to see who's around me, and I can see that all of my people have made it down. I don't hear anything over the comms. The only thing I do is hit a button that gives them the ready up signal. 
As I look around, I realize the ordinance had done its job. All the emplacements have been blown into pieces, and the anti-personnel ordinance has many, many of the enemy on the ground, either dead or very close to it. I realize I need to get my vehicle out. I run over to the other side of the pod, and it's already open. I grab the top, pull down, and my vehicle is there. A small scout vehicle. For this mission, they gave us the two-wheel vehicles. Sometimes we have four, but it's enough to get us from point A to point B as fast as we can. I hop on the vehicle, and though I have to switch hands so I have the throttle under my right side and my weapon in my left, I'm ready to go. I look off to my left side, and I see one of the other vehicles going past. I check my overhead map, and I am gone. Before I know it, I'm with the rest of my squad, and we're given our orders. That is how a drop is done. That is how we get ready. That is how we get to the ground. And that is how we get our people there, so we can bring all sorts of hell to the enemy. If we're lucky, some of these drops, we have the heavy stuff. But normally, the heavy stuff comes behind us in a secondary drop. Or a tertiary shuttle. That's when the really fun stuff happens. Many a times in those shuttles is not only extra soldiers to hit the ground, but also large caliber weapons. Many times, it's what the humans call a tank. And oh boy, you put us hell jumpers with a tank crew and great maker help you. <laughs>